Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for the introduction. Okay. So this, uh, this talk is organized in, in the following way. I will give first a very short introduction to multi-objective optimization uh, with the focus on the taxonomy. I will try to uh, construct the rest of the talk based on this taxonomy because uh, I want to emphasize a little bit the evolution in the design of multi-objective evolutionary algorithms we have had since the early days in the mid 80s up to now. And then I will focus on three topics. The, the uh, inception of this talk was based on, on a question somebody asked me many years ago. Uh, by the way, it was also in Spain. I was giving a talk in Spain and somebody asked me about some of the research topics that were still available at that time. This, this was probably 12, 13 years ago. Because at that time, there was already a lot of concern about not finding enough topics for research in, in IMO. And what I told this person was that the topics were there. It's just they were not that easy to see as they were 10 years before or 20 years before that. So I'm focusing only on three topics, although there are, of course, many others. And I will touch on that at the very end. First, algorithms, because this is what I have been doing for almost 30 years. Then scalability, which is one of those topics that uh, has many different aspects you can work on. And, and then parallelism. Parallelism, I believe, is still one of those topics which has been pretty much ignored by the emo community for, for many, many years. And there are reasons for that, but I, I will mention some of this. And in the last part, when I go to the current challenges, this is just to illustrate that there are many other topics sort of interleaving different areas. And, uh, and these topics, some of them are, of course, much more specialized. So that means it's much more difficult to, to do work there, but others are not that much. It, it depends on the background that, that you have. So let's start by a very short introduction to multi-objective optimization, just in case you are not fully familiar with it. In multi-objective optimization, we're interested in solving problems, having two or more objectives, but in here, the key element is that these objectives are conflicting. At least some of them must be. This is important because if we didn't have any conflict among the objectives, then the problem will be sort of trivial to solve because we could optimize each objective separately. We will find a single solution and that will be the solution to the problem. The conflicting nature of the objectives makes the problem very interesting because it's actually ill-defined from a mathematical point of view. So this is the formal definition. It's very simple. Instead of having two objectives, I have k objectives where k is greater or equal than two. And I may also have inequality and also probably equality constraints. So the first issue in multi-objective optimization is the notion of optimality. Unlike global optimization, in which the notion is, is very intuitive, and the best solution in the whole search space subject to the constraints that we have, in multi-objective optimization, the notion of optimality is not completely straightforward. In fact, there is more than one notion of optimality. The one that most people use and have used for, for a long time was originally proposed by a professor from Oxford University, it's Francis Isidro Edgeworth. He published in 1881 a book with a very strange title, Mathematical Psychics. And in this book, he refers to uh, finding trade-offs as the solution to a problem having two conflicting objectives. By trade-offs, he means compromise solutions or solutions in which it's not possible to improve one objective without worsening the other one. However, the reason why Edgeworth is not very well known today has to do with the fact that Wilfredo Pareto independently in 1896, that's 15 years later, he published a book called Cours d'Economie Politique. At that time, French was the language of science, not English, in which he came up with the same notion originally proposed by Edgeworth, but in this case, Pareto generalized the notion to any number of objectives. This notion that Pareto called in his book of a limity is now known as Pareto optimality. Some people call it Edgeworth Pareto optimality, but uh, most uh, people, at least in the evolution multi objective optimization community, don't use Edgeworth's name anymore, which is 
kind of unfortunate because he's the one who, who actually came up with the notion for us. The definition is, is actually very simple. If we assume that all the objectives are being minimized, and this is a reasonable assumption because we can always transform maximization into minimization, then we say that a vector of decision variables, which is feasible, that's what this means, in other words, it satisfies all the constraints, is parito optimal if there does not exist another feasible solution such that these two conditions hold. is less equal in every objective and is strictly less for at least one of them. There are variations of this definition. For example, if I remove this condition, keep only this one, the, the strictly less, this is called a strong optimality, a strong parity optimality. And if I remove the second condition and keep only the first, this is called weak parity optimality. A strong parity optimality obviously produces less solutions than parity optimality, and weak parity optimality generates more solutions. So in words, the definition of parity optimality is, is actually very simple. It says that the solution is parity optimal if it's not possible to improve one objective anymore without worsening at least another one. Because of the conflicting nature of the objectives, we are expected to have uh, several solutions rather than only one. And depending on how high the conflict is, this may produce, uh, let's say, more or less solutions. But in general, even if the problem is discrete, we will have a set of them, not a single solution. This set in decision variable space is called Pareto optimal set. The vectors corresponding to the solutions, including the set, are said to be non-dominated, but most people in EMO say non-dominated solutions, which mathematically speaking is, is not correct, but it's okay. Nobody really cares much about that. And the image that is the objective function values corresponding to the Pareto optimal set is called the Pareto function. If you have worked on IMO or have seen papers on IMO, you will know that Pareto fronts are an obsession in this community. People are really obsessed with having really complex, ugly looking geometries for Pareto fronts. The reason is that as the Pareto front becomes more challenging, this motivates the development of more powerful algorithms or more sophisticated algorithms, which in many cases may not be very useful in practice, but allows the area to continue in, in a way. And I will get into that when we talk about algorithms. Okay, so of course, evolutionary algorithms were not the first choice in multi-objective optimization. Back in 1970, research started on multi-objective optimization from the operations research side. And at that time, uh, the first algorithms were developed for uh, solving different types of multi-objective optimization problems, particularly for nonlinear, there are uh, several families of algorithms. And for, these for each of these families, there are several variations of algorithms available. These algorithms are in general very fast. They are very uh, efficient. However, they have several limitations. The main limitations have to do with two things. One is, uh, these algorithms, they in general generate one solution at a time. That means that to generate several solutions, several elements of the Pareto optimal set, the algorithm needs to be executed several times from different starting points. And there is no guarantee that changing the starting point will produce a different solution at the end. The other issue is the sensitivity of these algorithms to the shape and the continuity of the Pareto form. This, this is an issue, has been always an issue. On top of that, some of these algorithms require the first derivative or even the second derivative. Today we have, for example, a multi-objective version of Newton's algorithm, which requires the second derivative. However, when applicable, these algorithms, of course, are very fast and are very robust. Now we get into multi-objective evolutionary algorithms. Uh, multi-objective evolutionary algorithms started in 1985 with the algorithm in the third bullet with Vega, the vector evaluated genetic algorithm that was proposed by David Schaefer in his PhD thesis at Vanderbilt University in the US. This is considered the first ever multi-objective evolutionary algorithm. It's a very simple algorithm. It doesn't even use the notion of parity optimality. So in the old days, and the old days is a, a period that goes from 1985 up to 
I will say early 90s. These are the old days of the field. And we had the non-known algorithms, the non-elities and non-Pareto base. This means these algorithms didn't incorporate the notion of Pareto optimality in their selection mechanism. And also they didn't retain the non-dominant solutions generated by the algorithm at each generation or iteration. So these, we can say that are very naive, very simple algorithms. However, that's what we had during this period of time that goes from the mid eighties to the early nineties. Some of these algorithms were not really that bad. It's, it's just, they were limited because of the way in which they operate. For example, linear aggregating functions were very popular and even today some people use them is the simplest uh, approach. We only add up all the objectives into a single scalar value. And then we transform a vector optimization problem into a scalar optimization problem. And we can use, for example, a genetic algorithm to solve it. Of course, if we want to generate different solutions, then we have to be more creative, for example, to use weights uh, for each of the objectives. But linear aggregating functions, although are, are applicable in a, in a wide variety of problems, have the, the limitation that they cannot generate non-convex portions of the Pareto frame. So in the second half of the 90s, they became very unpopular in the specialized literature. Like most reviewers, whenever somebody mentioned that they had used a linear aggregating function, the paper would get immediately rejected, even if the results were reasonably good. So now from the, uh, the first half, let's say probably 93, from 93 up to the end of the 90s, there was a, a first period in which several very interesting algorithms were developed. They were still sort of naive in a sense, perhaps the, the exception, the remarkable exception here is MOGA, but the others were relatively naive based on, on an idea that was originally proposed by David Goldberg in his book from 89, which at that time was called Parito Ranking. Today, uh, this procedure is called non-dominated sorting, but it's pretty much the same. And the idea is very simple. The idea was, okay, let's introduce the notion of Parito optimality in the selection mechanism of an evolutionary algorithm. So how should we do it? And the proposal was, to have a ranking scheme in the selection mechanism that by using Pareto optimality will give the same probability of selection to all the solutions that were Pareto optimal in the population or non-dominated, it's the same. By doing that and, and giving a lower selection probability to solutions that were not Pareto optimal, then the idea was, I, have to pre I wanna preserve all the Pareto optimal solutions Therefore, I will be converging to the Pareto optimal set and I will be discarding solutions that are dominated in the population. And, and this is sort of the correct way of solving a multi-objective optimization problem. It is worth noting, however, that these algorithms still at this time were non elitist In other words, they didn't retain the Pareto optimal solutions that they generated, which is an issue because then you can lose some of these solutions when applying the, the uh, evolutionary operator. You apply crossover and mutation and you, you may lose some of these solutions. So we have here MOGA proposed by Fonseca and Fleming at a conference in 93, the original non-dominate sorting genetic algorithm in SGA introduced by Kaljan Moideb and one of his students in 94. This was the first algorithm published in a specialized journal that was evolutionary computation because that was the only specialized journal available at that time. And then we have MPGA, the niche Pareto genetic algorithm proposed by Jeffrey Hall. Then we have the contemporary approaches, which were uh, this period started from the late 90s, 98, 99, all the way to the, uh, I will say, the first half of the 2000s. From here, perhaps the most remarkable uh, algorithm is NSGA2 that was originally proposed in the year 2000, but the journal version was published in 2002, and this is the version most people know. The conference version was published in 2000 at PPSN. SPA, of course, from Eckhart Sitzler, 
that introduced the notion of elitism that most algorithms have adopted since then, which is based on using an external archive in which the uh, Pareto optimal solutions are stored. And, and this allows to retain solutions, but at the same time, it can be used as a density estimate, which is the other important component in multi-objective evolutionary algorithms, because we have to maintain diversity during the whole evolutionary process. So to maintain diversity means that we want to avoid convergence to a single solution because we want to produce several elements of the Pareto optimal set in a single uh, execution of the algorithm. And then, of course, in the last uh, group, we have the algorithms that are more recent. Of course, many algorithms have been developed, but in here, I, I'm talking of, I will say, families of algorithms, particularly when referring to Moia-D, which is based on decomposition. The original algorithm was proposed in 2007, and today there are many variants of this algorithm. I won't get into those, but I will talk a little bit about the idea of decomposition. Then another interesting family is indicator base, uh, from which the first algorithm was the indicator base evolutionary algorithm from Sitzler from the year 2004. But perhaps the most popular is SMS IMOA. The original version was uh, proposed in 2005, but the best known version was published in the European Journal of Operational Research in 2007. And of course, NSGA3, which is the most recent in this slide, is from 2014. It's still very, uh, very popular today. Uh, and, and this is kind of an interesting uh, algorithm in the sense that the algorithm was published in two parts, but most people only cite the first paper in which the algorithm is introduced because of some issues, Kalyan uh, has develop an application for a Swedish company and he put the algorithm as part of the application. So he gave the rights of the algorithm to the Swedish company. Therefore, he, he's not allowed to release the code, his own code in the public domain. So when the paper got published, there was a public domain version developed by somebody in Taiwan. And this has been perhaps the most popular version of the algorithm that has been uh, adopted by many people. But apparently, it is not too accurate. This version has some differences with respect to the original version. But there have been many improvements to the algorithm, although nobody really has the code except for Kalyamoide. They, they are improving on a version which is not the official version of the algorithm but still the algorithm has been very popular. So after 38 years of existence, the question that comes to mind is, uh, what remains to be done? Is, is there still some topic in which I can do research on it, particularly if I'm a PhD student or a young researcher, somebody who's starting his career in this area? And the question, and the answer is, of course, yes, it is possible. It is true that it's not, as easy as it was 20 years ago, but it is still possible. We just need to pay attention. So this talk is about that. So first, let's talk about algorithms. Algorithms, as I said, is, is what I have been doing for almost 30 years. So this is uh, an area with, with which I'm very familiar. So today we have three main families of algorithms in coding use. We have Pareto base, decomposition base, and indicator based multi objective evolution elements. I will get very quickly to issue. Pareto base is, is the oldest family that started in the uh, late 90s to become popular. And in this case, the two main comp components are a selection mechanism based on Pareto optimality and a second component called the density estimator. The density estimator is very important because this is the mechanism that will preserve diversity during the evolutionary process. In the old days, in the 90s, it was, for example, very popular to use something called fitness sharing, which is similar to clustering. But over the years, people have proposed a wide variety of mechanisms, going from crowding, which is what NSGA2 uses, Adapted grids, parallel coordinates, clusters, and so on. 
Some of these uh, density estimators are not scalable. For example, adaptive bits are not scalable. They are designed only for two objectives. But others can work with any number of objectives, for example, fitness check. Now, the main limitation of Pareto-based multi-objective evolutionary algorithms is scalability in objective function space. We know today that as we increase the number of objectives and we don't increase the population size in, in an exponential, exponential manner, then very quickly, every solution will become non-dominated or pareto -dominated. And this, of course, is very bad because if that happens, then we don't have any bias to search. And with no bias, we are searching in a random way. So this is the main limitation of this algorithm, is scalability. And this has to do with the fact that Pareto optimality is a very orthogonal relation. So it doesn't allow to distinguish between solutions when in a sort of a fine grain way, particularly as we increase the number of objectives. There are ways around this, for example, changing the density estimator. Some density estimators will allow us to distinguish solutions or relaxing the, the Pareto optimality relation. But these techniques were used some years ago, back in between 2005 and 2010. Today, they are not very popular. Today, people do research in a different way on scalability. And I will get to that because this is the next topic. Now, decomposition base is, is an interesting uh, idea. Actually, the idea comes from operations research. The idea here is to transform a multi-objective optimization problem into several single objective optimization problems, which are solved simultaneously, particularly MOIA-D, which was the first algorithm that introduced this notion into the EMO community. It uses a neighboring uh, search, or neighboring uh, suit problems that allow to search these solutions uh, simultaneously. So the algorithm is actually very efficient. Now, we do need something here that is called a scalarizing function. The scalarizing function is the one responsible for doing the decomposition. And associated to the scalarizing function, we need a set of weights. As we increase the number of objectives, normally we will need more weights. However, in this case, the increase is linear, it's not exponential as it is the case of Pareto-based optimality. So it's not too bad. These algorithms are normally very fast and they are very uh, effective. However, they do have uh, some weaknesses. The main one that was identified, I think, in 2015 by Hisao Ichibuchi, has to do with the fact that the, escala, the es escalarization function that these algorithms adopt is based on some mathematical assumptions about the geometry of the Pareto front. The underlying assumption is that the Pareto front can fit in a simplex. And if that is not the case, they don't work properly. So this was illustrated by Ichibuchi with a very simple example. He took some Pareto fronts of some very well-known benchmark problems, and he inverted the front. By doing the inverted version of the Pareto front, it turns out that the algorithm doesn't work anymore. Of course, we could use the inverse of the weights to make it work. But the point here is, what if we don't know if the, that the Pareto front is inverted? If we don't know that ahead of time, that the Pareto front requires inverted weights. So this is a, a research area in which some people are still uh, working today, but um, it's, I, I will say, a very uh, unusual situation, I think, to have an inverted Pareto front. But since it showed a weakness of this algorithm, it became a research topic. And that's how research is being done these days. The last family, personally, I consider it the most interesting one, the indicator-based algorithms. In here, the idea, the original idea from Sitzler, which other people had uh, discussed before him, like Joshua Knowles back in 2002, is what if, instead of using Pareto optimality, we could use a performance indicator to do selection? 
Of course, this is possible as long as the performance indicator fulfills certain mathematical properties. Uh, basically, it has to be fully Pareto compliant. That means uh, it must have a strict monotonicity with respect to Pareto optimality. The thing is, we only know one performance indicator with these properties, is the hypervolume. But the hypervolume, although it's very nice and, and it has been mathematically proved that if you maximize the hypervolume of a set of solutions, you will eventually converge to the Pareto optimal set. The problem in practice is that it's a very costly performance indicator. Its computational cost grows polynomially on the number of points, but exponentially on the number of objectives. So this makes the hypervolume unaffordable. In, in problems having more than uh, a few objects, more than six, seven objectives, it becomes unaffordable. Although there have been many efforts to produce improved versions based on geometrical uh, tricks, uh, there are some versions that can compute the hypervolume at a relatively low cost for up to 10 objectives, but this is still a difficult issue. This is, most people believe it's not possible to do it very, very efficient. With, for example, uh, in polynomial time, to obtain the hypervolume uh, in high dimensionality. There, there has been a lot of research on that. And of course, there are other performance indicators which are not fully Pareto compliant, but can still be used in the selection mechanism of a multi-object evolutionary ion in a relatively reliable way. A good example is R2. But uh, which is weakly Pareto compliant, but most researchers don't don't like this solution for for whatever reason. So today, something that is a common practice and, and is I have to say this is something I, I personally don't like much. Uh, and I have to deal with this as editor in chief of the transactions on evolution computation, is that there is some sort of uh, I will say almost an algorithm. To, to generate papers on, on uh, evolution and multi-objective optimization that many people use. And, and the procedure is very simple. They, they take um, an existing set of components and an existing multi-objective evolutionary algorithm. And, and they say, okay, I have this algorithm, this version of Moya D or whatever, and I will, I'm going to change the crossover, I'm going to change the density estimator, and I will add this other mechanism. And then I will test this with a massive validation using many test problems, several performance indicators. And you see this paper full of tables with lots of statistics in which they show that this version they are proposing is better than, than other algorithms that are in current use. But if you look carefully at the numbers, the differences are probably in the third decimal. So in practice, nobody is really going to use this algorithm except to compare their own results. But uh, the, the main concern to me here is that no new idea is really being proposed. It's, it's just a small variation of an existing idea, which in, in some cases, is sort of a circular idea in the sense that this is something that somebody proposed before, but with a different mechanism. So I have no problem with having these papers published even in top journals. The problem is that because of this practice, now becomes very difficult to actually publish a new idea because many of the reviewers we have in, in journals, in, even specialized journals, they don't seem to pay much attention to the new ideas anymore. They pay more attention to the statistics, to the methodology, and not to the ideas, which I believe is dangerous, but that's the way it is. And, and I have tried to fight against this. It's very difficult. It's very, very complicated. So what about the ideas? What about having other ideas? It's still possible, of course, but you have to think, right? You have to to the boat sometimes. So let me show you some examples. For example, uh, this was many years ago, back in the year 2013, I think it was, uh, or 14. I had this student from Cuba, a master's student. He came from machine learning. And he told me one day 
that he wanted to, to write his master's thesis under my supervision. And he tried to convince me to do machine learning using uh, evolutionary algorithms. And I convinced him to do multi-objective optimization. So he came up with a really interesting idea. He, he proposed an algorithm that uses a transformation procedure by which an arbitrary nonlinear multi-objective optimization problem is transformed into a linear assignment problem. The linear assignment problem, as, as you probably already know, can be solved in polynomial time, in order n to the third complexity algorithm. So he used the Hungarian algorithm to solve the linear uh, assignment problem. But the algorithm has other, other aspects that are interesting. For example, it uses a uniform set of weights, that, well, a set of weights that have been to, to be distributed in a uniform way. But the interesting thing about this algorithm is that at first sight, it doesn't belong to any of the three families that I mentioned before. It's not the composition base. It's not indicator base. It's not Pareto base. It, at the beginning, we thought it was a new family. Today, we, we have been able to identify that this procedure is very similar to the use of, of a performance indicator called R2. However, it doesn't produce solutions that follow exactly the distribution generated by R2. So it's in between. It's, it's close to an indicator base procedure, but it's not based on an indicator unless we see the transformation as an indicator, which is what we have been doing in, in recent work around this. This algorithm was incredibly difficult to publish because it's not extraordinarily better than other algorithms. It may, it outperforms several of them, but not all of them. But it's a new idea. It's, it's a new way of solving multi-objective optimization problems. And many reviewers didn't seem to be interested about that. Other ideas, for example, I think is, is important today given the high, the, the high volume of uh, algorithms and mechanisms that we have available in, in, in IMU to try to understand the limitations of the algorithms that we are using. So for example, uh, some years ago, but in 2017, we analyzed the different scalarizing functions to try to understand advantages and disadvantages they had when we use them, for example, for uh, algorithms based on R2. Not only the composition algorithms use scalarizing functions, also algorithms based on R2. And we found some really interesting things, like some of these scalarizing functions were really bad. And there was at least one that was very, very good and nobody was using at that time. Another idea that some people have explored is to combine components of multi-objective evolutionary algorithms into a single environment, a single platform, such that we can try the different combinations of components to find the most suitable for a, a particular problem. This is the idea behind Borg, developed by Patrick Reed some years ago. This uh, approach, of course, requires a lot of computer resources. Actually, he used a supercomputer for this. But it's an interesting idea in the direction of automated algorithm design, something that has been done a lot in single objective, but is not very popular in multi-objective optimization. We move quickly to the second topic, scalability. Scalability comes in two ways in multi-objective optimization we may refer to scalability in objective function space or in decision variable space. First, we will talk about objective function space because it's the most popular. As I mentioned before, the number of non-dominant solutions grows exponentially with the number of objectives. And this makes the selection mechanism completely useless. In the early days, and the early days are from 2005 to 2010, people explore two different approaches to deal with scalability. The first was to relax the Pareto optimality relation. And there are several ways of doing this. There were even PhD theses around this, like uh, Di Piero, his PhD thesis is on, on, on a relaxed form of Pareto optimality. Uh, Hiroyuki Sato, he proposed one that is completely flexible. And this is sort of the mathematically correct way of solving uh, a high uh, dimensional problem in objective space, because these relations, they reduce to Pareto optimality in low dimensionality. 
but they allow a fine grain uh, selection when we have many objectives. The second approach was to reduce the number of objectives during the search process. And, and there are several ways of doing this. This is called dimensionality reduction. So Dimo Brokov, for example, in his PhD thesis, he proposed uh, both a probabilistic and a deterministic way of doing this by building a graph showing the degree of conflict among the objectives. But there were other approaches that were based on, on other ideas, uh, including principal component analysis and so on. These approaches are not very popular today, but they were popular uh, more than 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And of course, there are many other ways. We can use machine learning techniques. We can use performance indicators. <laughs> we can use epsilon dominance, which was a popular archiving technique in, in, in the year 2002. Uh, and other ideas, such as these two archive multi-objective evolutionary now, something interesting is that it has been empirically shown that when we have more than 10 objectives, even random search may be better than, for example, NSGA2. And this is very interesting because when this topic, which is called today many objective optimization, which refers to solving problems having more than three objectives, then many people will show that this weird procedure that they were uh, proposing was able to outperform NSGA2. And, and the question is, yeah, okay, and, and why is that good if everybody can outperform NSGA2, including random search, right, in, in very high dimensionality? The real question is not if you cannot perform another algorithm that was not designed for, for dealing with many objectives. The real question is, can you find the Pareto optimal set if you have many objectives? But most people in their papers don't focus on that. They, they focus only on relative performance and comparing with respect to other algorithms. Another issue that is very interesting is what is the real source of difficulty in many objective problems? Is it true that scalability by itself it's, makes the problem more difficult? Uh, some people questioned this some years ago. In 2015, Hisao Chiwichi published a very, very nice paper in which he analyzed different issues that make a problem difficult, having many objectives. Some of them are very obvious, of course. Others are not that obvious. For example, performance, performance indicators. Most performance indicators for convergence are not designed for, for a high number of objectives. And those that can uh, work with a high number of objectives may be very expensive, like the hyperbole. But he touched on a very interesting issue that we had uh, discussed in a paper several years before, and no, many people didn't like this paper. Back in 2011, uh, in a collaboration with Oliver Chutzen, we analyzed uh, this, the real source of difficulty in many objective problems. And this paper, actually, the idea came by accident. We were working on something else, on, on hybrids between multi-objective evolutionary algorithms and gradient methods, and we stepped into this very interesting result. We, we were able to identify that, in some cases, we could increase the number of objectives, and the problem didn't become more difficult. And in other cases, even if we had very few objectives, even three, the problem was very, very difficult. So based on this, we, we were able to show uh, some mathematical uh, background on this and, and some examples. We were able to show that the scalability per se doesn't make a multi-objective optimization problem more difficult. The real source of difficulty that we found is associated to something else, which I, I won't get into details. It has to be with the cons of descent which are produced by the gradients of the objectives when they are considered combined in a combined way. But this was corroborated by Hisao Ichibuchi in this paper from 2015 in which he showed that algorithms such as NSGA2, which was not designed for dealing with many objectives, can properly solve many objective knapsack problems when the objectives are highly connected. 
correlated. In other words, again, having many objectives doesn't necessarily make the problem more difficult. There has to be other uh, additional conditions to make the problem difficult. There are, of course, many other topics associated to scalability, which are very interesting. For example, density estimators, visualization, performance indicators. All these are, are interesting topics, which are, of course, worth studying in, uh, in high dimensions. Now, what about the scalability and decision variable space? This is something that was disregarded for several years. We did some early work on this back in the year 2008 with some people from Spain. And also in 2013, we proposed the first multi-objective evolutionary algorithm explicitly designed for large-scale uh, optimization, where large-scale means more than 100 decision variables. This algorithm actually was able to solve problems, benchmark problems, having up to 5,000 decision variables based on something called cooperative coevolution. After this paper, many other people proposed other algorithms. But there are still some interesting ideas. For example, what if I have a large number of objectives and a large number of decision variables? Because normally the techniques used for each type of problem are different. What if I combine them? What sort of algorithm will I need in that case? Then we move to the last topic, parallelism. As I mentioned at the beginning, parallelism is a topic that has been disregarded for a long time by the uh, Emo community for a number of reasons. I think the main reason has to do with the fact that many emo people are not familiar with parallelism, at least not in a, I will say, more specialized way. Uh, and parallelism is not an easy topic because technologies used for parallelism are evolving very quickly and, and, and constantly. So it's difficult to, to, to stay up to date on, on the technologies that are used. But of course, this is an interesting topic because parallelism is, is all around today. Even if you have a laptop, it's likely the, the laptop we have several cores, several processors, and it is doing some sort of parallelism at a certain level, even, even if you are not explicitly programming anything in parallel. So some interesting topics are, for example, asynchronous parallel multi-objective evolutionary algorithms. Asynchronous co parallel computing is very common today because many people have access to clusters of computers in which the processors are not homogeneous. They are of different types, different speeds. So it's important to do some load balance and to optimize these computational resources that we have available. There has been some work on this, but not, not much. Also, implementations on GPUs. Uh, genetic programming people have been using GPUs for a long time, also people who do deep learning, but we don't have that many implementations of multi-objective evolutionary algorithms available for GPUs. Some people have explored this, but there isn't much work yet. Other possibilities is when you start being more creative. For example, some years ago, I had a PhD student who proposed the use of asynchronous parallelism combined with the use of micropopulation, something that we have been working on for more than 20 years, and, and propose an algorithm which uses a very small population size and adopts the hyperbola. And this algorithm works very well, even having uh, a relatively large number of objectives. It's, it's not computationally expensive because it's using a small population and the asynchronous parallelism takes care of the exponential cost of the hypervolume when, when increasing the number of objects. So it's a nice idea. Of course, the design of this algorithm has to be very careful. You need to know something about parallelism, uh, but it's not very, very difficult. It's possible. I think another area that is worth exploring is to exploit specific parallel architectures by designing algorithms that explicitly uh, gain some advantages from using these specific architectures, for example, GPUs or uh, grid computing, whatever. And there are many topics related to parallelism that haven't been explored today. For example, the theoretical analysis of parallel multi-objective evolutionary algorithms, fitted landscape analysis, the impact of topology on the performance of um, 
palette that objective resolution are arguing, uh, decomposition based or indicator based parallel multi-objective resolution. Uh, there has been some work on some of these topics, but most of this area remains unexplored even today. So for the last part, I think the main challenge for the coming years is to continue to open new venues of research in IMO. This is becoming, of course, much more difficult, but I believe it's still possible because uh, we have such a huge volume of papers that it's difficult to think of something that nobody had done before. I believe there are topics that are worth exploring and that have been avoided in a way by many people for during the years. Uh, not necessarily because they are very difficult, it's, it's because it's complicated to come up with a novel idea here. For example, one is performance indicators. Performance indicators is a very difficult topic. Not many people have worked on that. And those who used to work on that, most of them don't do it anymore. Fonseca, for example, worked a lot on, on performance indicators and did excellent work uh, in the 2000s but uh, eventually move to other to other topics. We don't have, for example, appropriate performance indicators for assessing diversity in many objective optimizations. And there have been some interesting proposals adopted from indicators that were designed for something else. For example, S-Energy uh, has been used for assessing diversity. It's not the only indicator, there are others. But there are not that many people working on this topic. Michael Emmett, for example, has done some really interesting work on this, but we need more, more work in this area. I believe it's also important to design new mechanisms for specific features of real-world problems. For example, expensive objective functions, uncertainty, uh, variable length encodings, and so on. Coevolution, I believe, also has a high potential to uh, change the way in which we design algorithms. As, as I mentioned before, in, in large scale, we use cooperative coevolution, but that's not the only use of coevolution. Coevolution has also been used for dynamic multi-objective optimization. But I think it's one of those topics that has been mostly disregarded by the EMO community. And I believe in general, it's important to uh, to bring ideas from other areas. Over the years, we benefited from this. For example, uh, back in 2003, Jonathan Filsen introduced red black trees to store non dominant solutions. It's a concept from data structures. Uh, people have proposed to use convex hull, quad trees, Bolognoi maps also in, in multi objective optimization, even in theory as a concept from economics. So, all these ideas that come from other fields, I think, have brought great benefits to the to IMO. But we need to pay attention to that and we need to get the interest, to attract the interest of these researchers and other fields in, into IMO. I think it's also important to bridge the gap between operations research and IMO. This is something I have been doing for almost 30 years. And, and one possibility here, the obvious one, is to hybridize into objective evolutionary algorithms with mathematical parameter techniques. This is something in which I, I did a lot of work many years ago. Today, not very active on this, but we did uh, a lot on hybrids, also with uh, direct search techniques, not only gradient based. Uh, Kalyan has done some interesting work on. Uh, the use of optimality conditions to estimate proximity of a solution to the Pareto optimal set, in other words, to define a stopping criteria for a multi-objective evolution. But there is much more that can be. So summarizing, I believe that IMO is still a very promising research area, which should remain active for many more years, uh, but we need to increase the diversity in the topics that we explore. And, uh, and we also need to be more creative. This is, I, I believe, the uh, the message I would like to give to, to conclude my talk. And if you are interested in knowing more about IMO, you're welcome to visit the IMO repository. It's a web page that contains lots of information, a large number of uh, references, including more than 300 PhD theses, a lot of public domain software that you can download, or links to the web pages from which you can download them. And there are public domain implementations of many algorithms and full platforms, for example, PlatIMO that contains more than 100 multi-objective evolutionary algorithms in, in MATLAB. 
So you are welcome to visit uh, this website to get more information about this topic. And that's all from my side. Thanks a lot.